My name is Jeff Kolnick, and I, uh, in, in, I'm in the Interfaculty Organization. I want to thank our hosts uh, for inviting us to the big city, the Big Apple. It's exciting. Uh, I want to say also there's a handout that we prepared from the Interfaculty Organization in your, in your uh, folder, and it says that we serve the faculty of the Minnesota State Universities, and maybe one day we'll organize them. So that would be, uh, <laughs> that would be good. <clears throat> in... Uh, Twelve years ago, in the state of Minnesota, before Tim Pawlenty became the governor, the state paid two-thirds of the cost of a college education, and now it pays about 43 percent. Last year, the Minnesota State Legislature appropriated 100 million new dollars to our system and 200 million new dollars altogether to higher education, which moved us from the 33 percent to about 43 percent. Two more legislative sessions will be back like this, which might not happen, we'll be back to where we were. And how did we get that, that additional $100 million into, into our system? I want to talk a little bit about that. It required that the legislature flip from 2000, in 2010, the legislature uh, flipped from uh, Democratic control to Republican control, and then we flipped it back in 2012 to Democratic control with big majorities which led to a tax increase of progressive revenue on the top uh, about 2% of Minnesota citizens, created a new tax bracket uh, that generated additional revenue. And uh, a lot of that money went to K-12, higher ed, went to transportation, all kinds of things that I think a lot of us uh, uh, would support. So that's what I want to talk about. And we did it through engaging our membership, but also participating in a broad-based coalition uh, to defeat two uh, rather nasty um, um, constitutional amendments. So in, I have to go back then to 2010 when the Tea Party was raging all over the United States and, and in Minnesota and for the first time in 32 years the Republicans took control of the Minnesota State Senate. It had been so long since the Republicans had been in control of the Minnesota State Senate that there was not one senator in the Republican caucus who'd ever chaired a committee. And they kind of went into self-destruct, and that's another story that we could kind of talk about. They had all kind of scandals and stuff like that. But that same year, the Democrats elected their first Democratic governor in 22 years, Mark Dayton, who ran on taxing the 1%, or really the 5%. He wanted to tax the top uh, 5%. And he won that election by 8,000 votes. If he had lost that election, we would be Wisconsin. Right? We would have had a Republican legislature in both houses, and we would have had a Tea Party Republican governor, who you've never heard of, who may become Michelle Bachman's replacement. At any rate, in 2011, there was a government shutdown that, uh, because the governor and the legislature couldn't agree on how much to slash budgets, uh, and so there was a government shutdown, which led to big borrowing from the schools, taking our tobacco endowment, cashing it into bonds and spending it at one time instead of taking uh, really hundreds of millions of dollars over many years. Uh, and in addition to that, in 2011, the Republican legislature, without the need of a governor's signature, put on the ballot a amendment to uh, essentially make marriage between one man and one woman the only kind of marriage that could be constitutionally possible in the state of Minnesota. We immediately opposed that. Uh, as, as a union. In 2012, not a lot happened legislatively, but the Republicans put on the ballot a voter ID amendment uh, that you'll hear more about uh, when, when, when Deborah talks. And so the IFO joined in a coalition, a broad-based coalition, to defeat those two amendments and, uh, and in the process elect progressive Democrats to the state legislature. We gave uh, quite a bit of money, and it's kind of in the, for us, quite a bit of money. Uh, the students had a large number of conservatives in their leadership and they took a position against voter ID but not against the marriage amendment. We gave the students about $2,000 to target Facebook and Twitter ads to students all across the system for get out the vote efforts and against the voter ID amendment. Then we gave $18,000 to a group uh, called Minnesota's United for All Families that were committed to lobbying against both the marriage amendment and the voter ID amendment and we put organizers for the last three weeks of the campaign on every state university campus to get out the vote and to educate people to vote against both amendments. And then we bought $5,000 worth of stickers and lawn signs and we passed those out and we'll talk about that. Uh, Deborah will talk a little bit uh, about that. Uh, and then we endorsed uh, many, many, many candidates, many of whom won. 
Uh, we fought against a number of candidates. So uh, uh, we 21 of the 23 candidates who received our endorsements and contributions won. And basically, there were suburbs that turned because I think there was just too much hatred in the Republican caucus for some of the wealthy suburbanites to tolerate finally. And they flipped. But then many of the state university campuses where we invested flipped from Republican to Democrat. And that's what gave us the majority. And that's what led to the vote for progressive revenue. And that's what led to the reinvestment in public higher education. So in this case, we joined a coalition really for, I think, in certain respects, for the first time in my recollection, that we really worked in coalition, broad coalition across the state. And it worked. And, and, and the, the challenge for the IFO going forward will be not to go back to business as usual and to say, how do we maintain that coalition that flipped the legislature, that led to progressive revenue, and that helped us uh, uh, move back toward, oh, I should say, there was also a tuition freeze. Minnesota has a two-year tuition freeze. Uh, we have enough money to uh, uh, give everybody about a 6% raise when the bosses finally decide to do that. And, uh, in, and, and, and uh, Minnesota legalized uh, same-sex marriage. So all that went down uh, over a two-year period. And uh, Deborah Wood. I want to talk about what this actually looked like on the ground. So um, I teach at one of the state universities in a community of about 65,000 people, St. Cloud State University. Um, when United for um, Minnesotans United for All Families came into St. Cloud State, um, they begin to organize, set up a kiosk in our student union, and they begin to talk to everybody that walked by their kiosk um, about these issues. Um, they educated them first, and then they invited them to join them um, as organizers, and invited them to a session where they could learn more about the issue, and um, they had set up phone banks, they did a lot of door knocking, they talked to students in dorms, they taught them how to challenge what was being said um, on the blogs, on the, uh, in the newspapers, we have, uh, you can respond to the articles that come up in the newspapers um, online. And so they taught them how to go online and respond to have a voice. Um, and they literally educated our entire community about these issues. So that when it came time to vote, people were actually voting on the issues and not the Republican sound bites. Um, and it made a huge difference. Um, Our local faculty union also participated by distributing the buttons and the lawn signs. I took one of those lawn signs home myself and put it in my front yard. A couple of days later, it was gone. So I went back and I got about 15 of those babies. <laughs> put them in my yard and they stayed. And it was going to take a lot of effort to pull up all 15 of them without somebody seeing you. So um, they stayed. Another organizing effort we did was around photo ID. Um, the senator from our area um, ha had put forward a bill that would require when you took your state ID picture, you had to disrobe like if you were wearing, a, um, for religious purposes, a headdress, then you would have to take that off in order to have your state ID picture taken. And so we made an appointment to um, go and talk to um, the senator, actually invited him to a town hall type meeting um, in our community. And he was actually from our city. And um, uh, it was at a local coffee shop. And all of the women showed up with something on their head. And we had a really wonderful conversation with them. Uh, <laughs> the, the bill was pulled. He actually uh, withdrew it. Um, and um, the women were, that participated in that were really excited about that. Um, most of them were women of color. Many of them were Muslim and new to our community and um, had never participated in that kind of um, organized uh, meeting with uh, state, or state legislators. So it was really, really very good. Um, I think that's it. I, I, uh, the other thing that I want to say, just, just one last thing, um, that our actions, um, all of them, made a difference. And in each of these um, examples and actions, it was the university towns um, across the state 
played a significant role in bringing about the change. Um, so had it not been for the organizing through our union, um, that wouldn't have happened. Thank you. Good morning, folks. I'm on Lil Taze's timeline, too, so it's <laughs> early for me as well. Want to thank CFHE on behalf of NFM for inviting us to be on this panel and on the program this weekend. Um, the campaign that I'm going to speak about is a little different than some of the others since it was a national campaign. Um, and I'm going to start with something that may in fact surprise many of you. In terms of the number of activities and the breadth of activities during Campus Equity Week this year, this was the biggest national week of actions in the last several years. And the appreciation really goes out to CFHE for all of the support that it provided and to dozens of you in this room and your organizations who really made it happen on the ground. So appreciation to all of you. Just for anyone who's not familiar with Camp Equity Week, it took place during the last week of October in 2013. It's a week of national ac actions to publicize and educate around issues of inequity on campuses and throughout higher ed. It was started initially about 14 years ago by contingent activists around the country, focusing primarily on um, inequities involving contingent faculty. It also is carried out in Canada every year where it's called Fair Employment Week. This year, one of the things that happened differently is that there was a decision uh, largely spurred by discussions within CFHE to expand the themes that would be addressed to broader kinds of inequities, particularly involving uh, student debt, inequities involving access for students, other kinds of race and gender inequities, uh, and that provided both some tensions that were expressed throughout uh, CFHE discussions, but it also created a lot of flexibility that greatly expanded the participation and the types of participation and the demographic groups that were participating this year. NFM's task as the central coordinator, at least when it was presented to me, was to generate as many activities and as many states as we can. Now that was <laughs> the basis under which I was hired to be central coordinator. We set a goal of 100 activities in 20 different states. A main part of our task was to pr provide information and action-oriented materials for anyone to use, serve as the central hub for planning, organizing, and sharing materials and ideas, which was accomplished largely through the CEW website. And I know many of you access that, but if you didn't, go to CEW2013.org. Uh, there are lots of materials there, toolkit materials that many of you sent to us, planning ideas for actions, for themes, for materials like the t-shirts, which many of your organizations modified and created your own versions as well, which we put up on the website for others to see and then modify themselves and be able to use um, relatively easily. One of our other tasks was to coordinate the national unions to generate regional and national media coverage. And that, as you can imagine, had certain kind of challenges to it as well, which I'll address shortly. We in NFM consider CW 2013 to have been a su substantial success despite and especially considering the various challenge challenges involved and I'll address some of those so shortly with some suggestions for ways they might be improved going forward uh, with another Campus Equity Week. We believe it demonstrated that higher ed faculty, staff, and students really can build a national campaign. When we started this, there was much skepticism about that, that it can build a campaign around contingent exploitation and other inequities, even in just a couple of months. 
It demonstrated that the national unions really can pull together around actions and not just principles. And it demonstrated we have a national base for carrying out actions. Lil, you talked about building your base. We have a base out there, actually. And this is part of what got identified for many of us and can be shared with you and your organizations. And it's a base that will do things that many of us think faculty often won't do, actions. What we have to show from all the efforts, and here's where we think this was the biggest campaign in the last several years, is that there were 141 activities on 120 campuses, and these are just the ones that were actually reported to us. We know that there were many more. We keep coming across more stories of people who did things but didn't inform the central coordination of it. The activities occurred in 27 states, and as far as we know, for the first time with Campus Equity Week, there were more than a majority of states involved. The dynamos, as you can imagine, were the union-dense states, especially California and New York. But one of the things that was especially noteworthy this year was that for the first time, a sizable number of events occurred in difficult low union states, such as Arkansas, New Mexico, Oklahoma, Texas, Virginia, and the most surprising one to me, anyone here from Alabama? Even in Alabama. Through the website, we also produced or shared all sorts of planning ideas, as I mentioned, mobilization and organizing ideas, toolkit materials, physical materials like 700 Campus Equity Now t-shirts, 5,000 buttons and 10,000 stickers, which got distributed around the country. For any of you who didn't get these or wish some more, we still have some t-shirts left. Just speak to me, there's some over here, as well as stickers and buttons. And we purposely decided to not put a date on it so that you could use it going forward for the next 20 years. <laughs> or until we get full equity. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> I'll go with 20 years. <laughs> As important, one of the things we have to show for all of this is the new and strengthened networks, alliances, and identification of individual activists who were part of the 1,000 faculty, students, and staff who organized efforts. Now that's an estimate, but I'm pretty sure that it's close to accurate. 1,000 faculty, students, and staff involved in organizing these activities and the several thousand students who attended or participated in, that, in these activities. Let me turn now, since I've gotten my first card, uh, to the, some of the challenges involved. And the most useful way to think of these is in terms of uh, in three main forms, practical challenges, political challenges, and conceptual challenges. Among the practical challenges, one was just simply getting everyone started. When we began this in late August, one of the first things we did was call many of you to find out what you're doing so that we could start putting it up on the website, publicizing it, showing people elsewhere what was going on. And the response we got from nearly every single person was, we're gonna do something, but we don't know yet what it'll be. What are they doing elsewhere? Everyone wanted to know what was happening elsewhere before they would commit to their own plans. So we sort of had to convince people that this really was going to happen when we didn't yet have something to show them was in fact happening. One of the other practical challenges had to do with funding. It was frankly not quite adequate for what we were trying to accomplish. We ended up getting contributions from the national unions and some state and local unions, totaling $40,000. And one of the other challenges is that it was received late. It came in uh, first in July and then some matching grants later in August, but it meant that we couldn't really get started until just two months before Campus Equity Week was due to begin. Partly as a result of that, we had this other challenge involving the short timeline, just two months to develop the website, create materials, assist with plans, identify organizers, coordinate the media outreach, and work through the logistical difficulties and political and conceptual tensions 
involved in these 141 events in 27 states and this decentralized collection of a thousand activists. Even though most of the work was done by local activists, which is one of the great successes this year, the central coordination was also very labor intensive. We had the resources to have only two full-time equivalent positions dedicated solely to campus equity week. One of the other challenges involved balancing national and local assistance. Our main focus in NFM was on the national coordination, which involved a lot of meetings, conversations, and so on. But we also put hundreds of hours into assisting activists who contacted us. From campuses where they had no resources, or personnel, but needed materials, needed ideas, and wanted to somehow host an activity that they were afraid would cost them their jobs. In most cases, there was no one except NFM to assist them and walk them through what CW is and can be at, at their campus, as well as to affirm for them that all of this national activity is really gonna happen and that will provide some legitimacy, credibility, and protection for their own participation. The decentralization of this national campaign was one of the substantial problems that we had to deal with connecting organizations and activists who had little connection and information sharing with each other outside of what we were able to provide. One particular example of this that we found out after Campus Equity Week was that the United Students Association against the United Students Against Sweatshops actually carried out their own week of activities in October, okay, on at least dozens of campuses around the country. But none of us seemed to have known about it or at least didn't share it with one another. But now we know about something that we can coordinate with for next Campus Equity Week. That was one of the big gains this year that we can build on going forward. The political challenges in past Campus Equity Weeks with the national unions was that they all participated, but they didn't especially coordinate with one another. They operated within their own unions internally, primarily. We tried to improve this by identifying geographic areas of strength for each national union encouraging them to be especially active in those areas and fill the remaining gaps with whoever and whatever was possible. We also put substantial effort into assisting and encouraging media outreach by the national unions and for the first time in the history of Campus Equity Week, we're able to distribute joint press releases from the four primary faculty unions, AFT, NEA, SEIU, and AUP along with CFHE. In fact, we sent out three press releases to a distribution of more than a thousand media outlets along with 1,500 campus newspapers. We ended up with 31 media stories including national outlets like NPR, USA Today, Al Jazeera Network, and the Real News Network, 98 website we reprints, 22 linked headlines on websites, and dozens of blogs. And this is one of the other things that uh, was much more extensive this year was the social, social media outreach. Uh, on the conceptual difficulties, since I'm out of time, just want to mention again, there was a lot of tension around the themes and how much to expand the type of inequities to be addressed. Uh, that tension still exists, but everything that we've been informed of is that most of it was resolved at campus levels or organizational levels by mid-October and did not derail or substantially interfere with any activities anywhere. I'll just close by coming back to the students and saying that CW 2013 created the opportunity for thousands of students to work with faculty, students, and staff and for us to work with them as well. We now have a network out there that we can build on they're available for us to do that. They want to do that. And I can tell you from being in touch with so many people in so many places, there was a really a lot of enthusiasm to be engaged in this, this year and appreciation that there was a model available from the contingent movement that provided a foundation for doing it. Thank you.